go ahead and say I'm dead and gone, but you will see that you were wrong. Go ahead, try to hide the sun, but all will see.
the guard and the jail, the hammer, the nail. How could a night be so long? Then came. From afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done, they'd taken her son, wasted before his time. She knew it was true, she'd watched him die too, she'd heard them call him just a man. But deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow her son would live again. Then came the morning, night turned into day, the stone was rolled. And life had won, for morning had come. Death had lost, and life had won, for morning had Of a city called glory so bright and so fair as I entered the gates I cried holy The angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion. And oh, the sights I saw. I said, I want to see Jesus, cause he's the one who died for all. I bowed on my knees and cried, holy. My head. 
I sang glory to the Son of God. I sang glory to the Son of God. As I enter the gates of that city all my loved ones they knew me well they led me down the streets of heaven and all the sea too many to tell. I saw Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. I talked with Mark sat down with Timothy but I still said I want to see Jesus cause he's the Turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, please. I want to speak on Jesus Christ, the most outstanding person in history. There's been a number of important and influential people who have existed in the past. And we could spend a, a long time going through the list who have had effects upon history. There's been politicians that we could call by name, athletes, scholars, Writers, scientists, thinkers, business geniuses that have all had powerful impacts upon our culture and upon people around the world. But in spite of their influence on humanity, none have ever had the effect upon the entire population of the world as the person Jesus Christ. He was born in a stable in a little town called Bethlehem, grew up as a carpenter in the obscure village of Nazareth in Israel. Even though he lacked formal education, never went into business himself, had no 
political aspirations. His name became well known throughout history, and today it's known throughout the world, such as no other name. The question remains, why would the name of Jesus become so popular among so many people for such a long time? That's a great question, but it's what we're celebrating here today. It's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not another person that can make such the claim that Jesus Christ made. Let's read, if you would please, the first eight verses with me in, in uh, Luke chapter 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered His words. Heavenly Father, I pray You'll bless the reading of Your Word. Thank You for this day of celebration. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And what that implies is powerful, that Jesus is alive. And he sits today at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And Father, for this we give thanks. And I pray that you'll so move our hearts today to appreciate him even in a greater light. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's examine this question. Why would the name of Jesus become so popular among so many people uh, throughout the world? Now, some countries are atheistic or they have a dictator and they will not allow uh, freedom of religion in the world. And yet there are underground churches that talk about Jesus Christ. I mean, you just can't keep Christ out of countries. And many of these countries try their very best to do that. Isn't it sad what you see on the news today that people are killing others just because they claim to be a Christian? How tragic that is. The the Christian name, it it invokes passion, it it evokes emotion. How is that possible? Here's a guy that lived 2,000 years ago. He never went over hardly 50 miles in his life. There wasn't newspapers back then. There wasn't television. There wasn't the media. And yet, he, he touches so many people's lives throughout history and even so today. Let's look at a few reasons why. It's because his power exceeds any other. His power exceeds any other person's power that has ever existed upon this planet. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. What a claim that is. Jesus says, All power. What's he say? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In other words, I have all the power there is. What a claim that is. If Jesus Christ has such power, I can understand then why his influence would be felt around the world. The reason he can make this statement, and nobody else can in the entire world, is because he's God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. He's just very clear about it, very pointed. In other words, in case there's some confusion, let me make it crystal clear. I and my Father are one. You say, how can that be? He's God in the flesh. God in the Spirit is in heaven. They're both God. And there was a reason that God had to do that. And we'll see that. Notice in John chapter 12, verse 44, if we have it up here, great verse. Jesus cried and said, notice this verse. 
He that believeth on me, that's Jesus speaking, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. In other words, when you look upon me, you're looking upon God. What a claim that is. That's tremendous. When you look at me, you don't see me. You see God. You see the Father that sent me. What power. Jesus says, I am God in the flesh. It's no wonder I have such power. I mean, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this disturbs some scientists who get their funding, of course, from the government, who have to fall in line with the grants and the the foundations say they have to believe. But the fact is, God created the heaven and the earth. And Jesus was instrumental in that because he's God. Buddha might have been a nice guy, but he's still dead. Confucius, he's still dead. Muhammad, he's still dead. But Jesus of Nazareth is alive. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. There was a Buddhist one time in Africa who was converted to Christianity. They asked this Buddhist, why did you change your faith? Here's what he said, it's like this. If you're walking along and you come to a fork in the road and two men are there, one's dead and the other's alive, which man's directions are you going to follow? That seems pretty simple. Should I listen to the dead guy who I can't hear? Or should I listen to the one who's alive? He says it's not very hard. His power exceeds any other. Because he's God in the flesh. Secondly, because he's the only way to God the Father. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. He had the power to back up his claim. And certainly he demonstrated his power. I mean, he walked upon the waters. He calmed the storms. He says, the storms are raging. He just simply walks out there and says, peace, be still. And even the elements obey him. Those with demons in them, when Jesus came before them, they had to give way. They had to flee. He had the power over demons. Those who were sick whether it was the palsy or whether they were blind or whether they had leprosy or whatever. When Jesus touched their lives, they were made whole. I'm saying he had the power over the illnesses. He could even touch the dead and life would spring back into them. And so there was no question about the fact that he backed up his claim that all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. I have that kind of power. Well, I'm kind of interested in an individual like that. And plus, when I watch what he does, everything that he does is good. Some of these people who claim to serve a God, I don't know that I'd want their God. But I'm glad I serve a God that loves me. I serve a God who loves the world, even to the point where he sacrificed his life for the world. The mistake many people make is thinking they have a privileged access to God the Father without going through the Son of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you want to talk to the Father? Talk to me. Go through the Father through me. That's how you get access to the Father. It's like going to the White House. (laughs) You're not going to pick up your phone and say, hey, let me talk to Obama. It's not going to happen. You You have to go through a half a dozen people and then you're still not going to get to him aren't you glad you can go to the father but you go through the name of the lord jesus christ he says everybody can come to me but you got to go through me and it's only right because jesus is god he's the most outstanding person in history because he's the only accepted sacrifice for the sins of mankind You see, man, the only reason Jesus became flesh, God came down here and took upon himself flesh, is because 
Men and women are sinners. When Adam sinned, man, I'm telling you what, sin just blanketed the planet. Everybody that was born after that inherited the sin nature. Isn't it interesting? That's why Jesus' birth was different than any other birth. He didn't have an earthly father. Mary brought him forth, but he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. That was necessary. See, everything's necessary. Everything written in the Bible, there's an importance there. He had to have been born of the Holy Spirit, or he would have inherited the sin nature as well. And so God set it up. It's not going to happen. He's God. He's perfect. Matter of fact, he lived a sinless life. And that's the reason he was born. God looked down at us. <laughs> Maybe he had me in mind. He thought, boy, that's a pathetic guy right there. I got to help that guy. He needs all the help in the world. But the fact is, we're sinners. We couldn't help ourselves. We're born into it. We just do bad. We, we disobey God. We break his laws. It's just in our nature to do it. It's kind of like saying, don't sit on that bench that I just painted. <laughs> right, it's the first thing a kid will do, won't he? Sit down. And so we couldn't help ourselves. And God says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Sin brought forth death. And God says the only way to satisfy the sin issues, there has to be a death. But it has to be the death of somebody perfect. And you and I are not perfect. So God looks down at our dilemma and says, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to die in your place. But God can't die. How are you going to kill God? God says, I've got that all worked out. I'm going to take on my flesh. So therefore, I will have flesh. I'll still, the Spirit of God will still be in heaven. God will be on earth, only he'll be in the flesh. But he will be perfect in every regard. Satan tempted him. Satan did everything in his power to get Jesus to, to, to sin. But he couldn't do it. And Jesus was perfect and they crucified him, a perfect sacrifice. And that's what it took to bring salvation to this world. God had to do it for us. That's how much he loves us. Don't you ever cringe when somebody takes God's name in vain? What are you doing that for? God loved you more than you can even imagine. Why in the world would you cuss him? And use his name in vain. But people do it all the time. They just simply do not realize that they're taking in vain the very name of the one who loves them more than anybody else loves them in the world. You see, he's the only accepted sacrifice for the sins of the world. You couldn't die for your sins. I couldn't die for the sins of the world. Nobody could because we're simply sinners and it required a perfect sacrifice only Jesus, the Son of God, could do that. His power exceeds any other person because he's the only means of receiving eternal life in heaven. John 3, 18, great passage of Scripture. He that believeth on him, that's Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verily I, verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, Jesus says, hath everlasting life. The Bible is crystal clear that salvation is only found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not found in Eastside Baptist Church. Now we hope that when people come to Eastside Baptist Church and we point them to Jesus Christ, that they will accept Christ as their personal Savior. But by joining G Eastside Baptist Church doesn't get you to heaven. You've got to have Christ in your life. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It's so crystal clear. This is why Easter, what a celebration it is. Because he rose from the dead. 
Only those who have been born again by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have any hope of his spending eternity in heaven. And also, Jesus is the most outstanding person in history because he defeated both death and hell. Nobody else can do that. You can't. I can't. I think Houdini tried it. You remember the magician. I mean, he would do these death-defying acts. And one time he, he was asked, you know, when you die, can you see if you, we want you to send a message back. Send some kind of a message back to us. And there's people who waited for the message when he died. That he was somehow alive and was going to communicate with them. But Houdini couldn't do that. There's only one person who has the power, the Bible says, to lay down my life and to take it back again. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's alive today. That's why the tomb is empty today. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. In other words, he's in charge. He, he, has, he has the power over hell. He has the power over death. He has all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. Man, I want him on my side. I want him on my side. And in order for, for, do, for, me to, for him to be on my side, I have to throw my hat in the ring with him. I have to accept him, believe in him, and trust him and give my life to him. Many of you have done that, and you know what, exactly what I'm talking about. How wonderful it is to know that Jesus Christ, on that third day, when those disciples and those ladies went there, he wasn't there. The Roman soldiers couldn't hold him. Pilate couldn't hold him. Satan couldn't hold him. Death couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him because all power is given unto him in heaven and earth. He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. And he loves us. And he wants us one day to spend eternity with him. Oh, my, why wouldn't the world give their life to him? It was on February the 27th, 1991. At the height of Desert Storm, that Ruth Diller received a very sad message from the Pentagon. It stated that her son Clayton Carpenter, private first class, had stepped on a mine in Kuwait and was dead. Ruth Diller later wrote, she said, I can't begin to describe my grief and shock. It was almost more than I could bear. For three days, I expressed anger. I expressed loss. For three days, people tried to comfort me, but to no avail because the loss was simply too great. And maybe you and I can mentally do our best to somehow identify with that, and maybe some of you have been there. But three days after she received that message, the telephone rang. The voice on the other end said, Mom, it's me. I'm alive. Ruth said, I couldn't believe it first. But then I recognized his voice. And he really was alive. The first message was all a mistake. She said, I, I laughed. She says, I cried. I felt like turning cartwheels because my son, whom I thought was dead, was really alive. And my friend, we're celebrating such an occasion. Jesus isn't dead. He's alive. Amen. And my friend, that's what the disciples felt that day when the tomb was empty and Jesus began to appear to them alive and well and giving them hope and telling them what the future holds. They were thrilled over it. And I hope you're thrilled over the, 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 the fact today that you, you serve a resurrected Savior who has all power in heaven and earth. You see, people were sinners on the road to hell, and they could do nothing to keep that from happening. They would die in their sins because there was nothing they could do to satisfy God's demands for forgiveness. It was, we were powerless to, to save ourselves. 
Then Jesus died in our place, was buried in a borrowed tomb. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. And in so doing, Jesus defeated the power of death that day. Satan thinks that death is the, the pinnacle uh, of, of, uh, of his arsenal. You're going to someday die. And my friend, death hangs over the world. Everybody dies. But Jesus walked into the scene and said, I'm going to end that. Oh, your body might die, but child of God, you never die. Amen. You never die. When, you, when a child of God, a person who's placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you don't die. The Bible says when you, to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. I close my eyes in death, I just open them up in heaven. I mean, it's, it's not like I die, I just simply move. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's why I'm going to get me a nice house. <laughs> I'll give you a nice house one of these days. The Lord's up there building it even now, and he's not only doing it for me, he's doing it for you as well. In my Father's house are many mansions. Isn't that great? I go to prepare a place for you. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That's my hope. That's your hope. It's the hope of everybody, and especially those who have hardly anything in this life. Their only hope is that someday God, a God who loves them and cares for them, will give them an eternity of paradise and joy, and God will keep his promise. You see, he defeated the power of death that day. He defeated the power of hell that day. What's that mean? If you're a child of God, you'll never see hell. You'll never see, you don't even have to worry about it. If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're living for Him. He, you claim Him as your Lord and Savior, and, and, uh, and, and you're identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'll give you everlasting life. You will never, never, never perish. What a promise! It's the hope of the world. No wonder he's the most outstanding individual who's ever lived. Jesus brought hope to a world that had no hope. You may be here today. And your life isn't what you want it to be. I understand that. All of us are in that condition at some point. You're so frustrated with life. You don't even see a future. Matter of fact, it looks dismal out there. And matter of fact, if you read the newspaper or you look at the news, it gets more dismal, doesn't it, every day. The difference is, in Jesus Christ, that all changes. Without him, you have no hope. Whatever happens, happens. And you die without Christ, you never see heaven. But in Christ, you have a you have a God that loves you and is watching over you and cares for you and protecting you. And regardless of what happens, you close your eyes in death, you wake up in eternity. And it's going to be wonderful, wonderful, wonderful when you get there. No one but Jesus Christ has such power to overcome, overcome Satan and give eternal life to those who put their faith and trust in him. Thirdly, He's the most outstanding person in history because he's able to forgive sins. And that's a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Sin's what keeps us out of heaven. Jesus has the power to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. Notice the verse on the screen. But he whom God raised, again, that's Jesus, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you, what? The forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Through who? Through Jesus. There's no other person that can affect your sins. I can't. You can come to me and say, Preacher, uh, would you forgive me of your sins? I, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't even forgive me of my own. <laughs> but Jesus can. Amen? Right. He says, if I confess them, he's faithful and just to forgive me. 
and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Who? Jesus Christ. I'm telling you what, today is a day worth celebrating. Because we're celebrating the greatest personage in history and who's touched this world in such a positive fashion that nobody else can even hold a candle to him. And lastly, Jesus Christ is the most outstanding person in history because he is able to grant eternal life to those who trust him as Savior. Now that interests me. I want eternal life. If there's eternal life out there, I want it. I can't imagine people not wanting it. Do you realize that the big moneyed people, the billionaires, they're putting a lot of money into research today on how you can live forever. <clears throat> they're backing the scientists and the, the great minds of science who are trying to figure out how to overcome death. And they're working on this right now as we speak. These guys, they want to believe, <laughs> these billionaires, <laughs> I guess they don't make enough money in one lifetime, all right? They want a thousand years to make as much money as they possibly can. And so they're pouring their money in, and once you find the secret, give it to me. My friend, I have the secret. It's in Jesus Christ, and it doesn't cost me a dime. It's free. He says, I give it freely to you, eternal life. You'll live forever. See, that's why the Lord's for, the, for the, the low guy and the gal that doesn't have much, for the widow, the fatherless, the orphan, those people who many of the world passes by and just shoves them to the side. Not, not Jesus. He steps into the picture and he says, I'll build, I'll build a paradise for you. I'll take you to heaven if you believe in me and trust in me. And they do. Boy, I'm glad God loves us as he does. And he alone is able to grant eternal life to those who trust him. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Not one person needs to be kept out of heaven. It's available to everyone. Jesus conquered death and hell so that he might allow us into heaven. Let me close with this illustration. The apostles all died for their faith. The question is, would they die over a lie? Would they actually steal the body, which was the story, the disciples snuck in there and stole the body of Jesus Christ? Yeah, but why would they die to hide a lie? Would they? Well, there's a man by the name of Charles Colson. You remember the, the name. The former counsel of President Nixon, convicted conspirator in the Watergate scandal. He writes that the Watergate cover-up convinced him that Jesus was raised from the dead. You say, how is that? He said this, and this is quoting, There were only eight to ten of us in the inner circle around the president who really knew what was going on. All we had to do was stonewall for a couple of months, and the Watergate scandal would be over. We had all the power and prestige of the presidency at our fingertips. And if the truth broke, there would be embarrassment and perhaps a prison sentence. There was no grave danger. Our lives were not threatened. But he says the problem is we could not hold the conspiracy together more than two weeks. We could not contain the lie. He says once we were informed that we were going to be prosecuted, the natural instincts of self-preservation were so overwhelming that the conspirators, one by one, deserted their leaders. They caved in. They stood in line at the prosecutor's office to escape the jail time. Colson concludes, I know that the disciples could not perpetuate a lie like the resurrection 
because it was not just their reputations that were at stake, their lives were in danger. They had no clout. They had nothing. To, this is the disciples. They had no clout. They had nothing to gain by the lie. And yet every one of them stood fast in the conviction that Jesus was alive. Take it from one, Charles Coulson says, take it from one who saw firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up is. Nothing less than a witness, nothing less than a witness as awesome as the resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain uh, to their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and he is Lord. He says all of them but John uh, were martyred for the cause of Christ. And he says, I'm here to tell you that you just don't go to your death defending a lie. They saw him. He was alive. He appeared to them. He talked to them. They touched him. They saw him ascend back into heaven. And the same Jesus that you see ascending up, the angel said he's coming back again just like you saw him going up. And my friend, he is coming again. I hope you're ready to meet him. Stand with me, please. Who's going to carry the light? Tell me who's going to keep it shining bright. All through the night until home is inside. Who's going to carry the light? Yes. <laughs> 
has been silent while the world raised its voice. In loud and angry tones they took the lead. But all across creation there's a rumbling in the hills as the chosen ones of God stand up to make his message known. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops, proclaim it from the mountaintops. Proclaim the Savior's might, but the Spirit of the Lord said they should wait. You see, God knew His children were ready to march on and proclaim His word throughout the land and seal the devil's fate. But the world still tells us daily that God is not alive. Salvation's plan is just a fairy tale. Don't change the truth that Jesus died. 